Let's go to our preaching time. Let me ask you to open your Bibles, please, to the book of 1 Peter, chapter 1. 1 Peter, chapter 1, and we're going to read verses 13 through 21. 1 Peter 1, verses 13 down through verse 21. We read, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of person judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but ye were redeemed, with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead, and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. Every Christian ought to be so eternally grateful for the love that God has bestowed upon him or her in saving of their soul and writing their name in the Lamb's Book of Life. Uh, his grace and His mercy that uh, are blessings to the believer continually. Um, someone has defined grace as God giving you something you don't deserve. And mercy is what keeps God from giving you what you do deserve. And I think that's a pretty good way to define those two things. You can meditate on that um, summary all day long. But uh, God, his main, his main attribute is holiness. And so he says, be ye holy, for I am holy. He's absolutely pure. He's perfect. He's sinless. He's without stain or any defilement whatsoever. And he has commanded you and I to be holy because he's holy. So I call this sermon the violated commandment. Be ye holy, for I am holy. It isn't just, you know, a recommendation or advice, you know, a point of opinion. May take it or leave it. No, it's a commandment. It's a commandment from God. Be ye holy, for I am holy. The word holy is closely related to the word sanctify. When something is sanctified, uh, it is separated out from the rest of the group for a specific purpose and uh, a task to perform. Now, that act of sanctifying it is called separation. And once the thing has been sanctified or separated, it is now declared to be holy reserved exclusively for whatever purpose God has for it. In the Bible, some things were said to be holy. The priest's garments of Aaron and his sons, they were said to be holy garments. The altar of burnt offering, where the sacrifices were, were offered, that was said to be a holy altar. The two parts of the tabernacle were the holy place and the most holy place, the innermost uh, part. The scriptures themselves are said to be holy. Paul says, And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. 2 Timothy 3.15 And uh, God has declared some things to be holy. But you have to work at it. It's not an automatic thing in the life of a Christian who's still carrying around this body of flesh and uh, weakness of temptation and sin and lust and every other uh, desire. So I want to consider what I call the violated commandment. Point number one, if you're taking notes, consider holiness in the scriptures. The commandment of the Old Testament, be ye holy for I am holy, is found a number of times uh, in connection to specific acts, specific sins. And in the book of Leviticus, chapter 19, you don't need to turn, but uh, verses 1 and 2, holiness is tied to fearing father and mother and not worshiping idols and in making a free will offering 
to God for God's service. You know, God doesn't twist your arm or put a gun to your head and force you to give up smoking when you get saved. He doesn't force you to give up profanity. He doesn't give, force you to give up any number of things that seem to be so enjoyable to your flesh. But when you, as you grow in grace and knowledge, but, but when you give up those things for his service, you are exercising holiness. Somebody said amen to that, but apparently it was up the street at the other church. It wasn't here. But in Leviticus chapter 20, verses 7 through 26, it's a lengthy section, we won't read it. But it's given concerning witchcraft and adultery and fornication, homosexuality. God said, ye shall not walk in the manners of the nation which, ye, which I cast out before you, for they committed all these things, and therefore I abhorred them. Read Leviticus 18 sometime, and all the perversion and the filthiness of the sodomites and the queers, and all the wretchedness of their sin, their adultery, and men with their sisters and brothers and so forth, people with animals and so forth, you name it. And God says, all of the nations which I drive out committed all of these things. And there are groups here in the United States today uh, who are committing all of those things. Trust me, they're out there. You just don't read about them every day in the newspaper. But once in a while, they'll, they'll raise their ugly head in society. And you'll hear about some horrendous, uh, horrific, terrible, perverse thing going on somewhere. And for them, that's just the way, that's just part of normal life. Because they're perverts! In Leviticus chapter 21... The command of holiness is given to the priests to not to, to be separated to God and not defile themselves by touching a dead body. They weren't to do that. So God told the people, if ye obey my voice, then ye shall be a holy nation unto me. You, you want to pay attention to those places in the Bible that begin with if and conclude with then. Because it shows you the conditions necessary for God to act. The thing that he says has to be in place before he's under any obligation to respond. Uh, Israel told Moses, all that the Lord commandeth us, we will do. But they didn't do it because they couldn't do it. They didn't have what you have. You have been given more <clears throat> as a New Testament child of God than the Jew had in the Old Testament. Do you know that? You have the forgiveness of your sins without having to bring an animal or an offering to an altar. Jesus Christ was your sacrifice. He suffered for your sake. You have the uh, uh, access to God without needing a priest to run in between you and God. You have direct access to him yourself. You have the Holy Spirit living inside you uh, by the new birth, and he'll never leave you nor forsake you. In the Old Testament, he could come and go. And uh, you could drive him away by your own sin and, and, and iniquity. Uh, you have a complete Bible you hold in your hand. You can have 100% uh, confidence in the Word of God, Old and New Testaments. They didn't have that in the Old Testament. So you have much more. And the, the Lord Jesus said, Luke 12, 48, Unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. And so since you have more than they had, God has a right to expect more from you than he expected from them. Now, he commanded holiness, but the Bible says that those things were written in old time were to teach us that the law was our schoolmaster, Galatians 3 says, to bring us to Christ. It was to show how feeble man's attempt would be to please God. If, he would just, if God would just tell man what he needed to do, then man thinks he could set about and do it without any trouble. But he, he met with nothing but trouble. He couldn't do it. And so the commandment of God is to be ye holy, for I am holy. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul says, Seeing then that we have these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1. And he says, I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. And the verse just before that, verse 22, said, abstain from all appearance of evil. So make no mistake, you're, you're not saved by living a clean life or a holy life or doing good deeds, but you're saved for the purpose of then bringing about those things. Ephesians 2, verse 10 says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works 
which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So you're not saved by living a clean life or a virtuous life and abstaining. Those are great ways to conduct yourself in society, but they have nothing to do with salvation. So you're not saved by living that way. You're saved, and then you're supposed to live that way out of gratitude and thankfulness to God. The, the cults like the Mormons and other groups, they have it all backwards. They think if, my, if by my good deeds I can get God's attention, I can earn favor with God, I can work my way into heaven. And, but that list of do's and don'ts is very subjective. It's usually some list that their church has approved of and is put out there for all their members to abide by. But like I say, it's just some, it's the decision of men. The Mormons have this thing they call the word of wisdom. And they take any devotion to the scriptures and they transfer that to dev devotion and obedience to their church prophets. One of their church prophets said, you know, don't, don't smoke, don't drink alcohol, don't drink, don't take tobacco or any strong stimulants and so forth. They call that the word of wisdom Joseph Smith gave to his followers. I don't need Joseph Smith. I got the Bible. The Bible says uh, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. You take the temple of God and make it drunk and make it uh, corrupt it with tobacco and alcohol and everything else? No! I don't take the temple of the Holy Ghost and join it up to some prostitute. I don't need the Joseph Smith to tell me. I got the word of God. Here's a book. I brought this out for show and tell. Uh, this is a Mormon book published by Bookcraft, one of their publishing companies, called By Grace Are We Saved? Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? But the subtitle says, The Necessity of God's Grace in Addition to Man's Good Works. So, Dr. Ruckman used to say, uh, every heresy is some truth taken out of the Bible and put in the wrong dispensation. And that might be the way to get saved in the tribulation, faith and works, but it's not the way now. Secondly, let's move on. Consider holiness in the mind. Holiness in the mind. Notice the ways in which the Apostle Paul admonishes us to holiness in verse 13 of our text. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. The mind is the first thing that needs to be sanctified and, and recommitted to God every day when you wake up. Doctors, uh, neurologists, medical experts, they've been saying for years that the, the human brain, the human mind is like a life time, a lifelong computer. It takes in everything it sees and hears and stores there, it's stored there permanently. What are you putting into your mind, I, I might ask? When you get up in the morning, do you, do you try to spend any time reading the Word of God? You're just reading a couple of chapters as you work through from cover to cover or reading some, uh, have some pattern, of some reading pattern that you follow? That teaches you certain things along the way either either way or do you just you know open your, your laptop and check your email and see if you got any important text from somebody and then out the door Paul says whatsoever things are true whatsoever things are honest whatsoever things are just whatsoever things are uh, pure whatsoever things are lovely whatsoever things are of good report if there be any virtue and if there be any praise think on these things Philippians 4 verse 8 you can't get much of that just watching YouTube videos of kitty cats and YouTube videos of somebody's instant karma. Some bully at school picked on a little kid and then as he was running away, uh, proud of himself, he slips and falls and hurts himself and everything. Yeah! That's what he deserves. You can't get much of that just watching nonsense or texting, you know, playing video games on your phone, all that kind of time wasting. Paul says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Romans 12, 2. The mind has to be renewed every day. Like I said, some things in the Old Testament were declared to be holy for God's purpose. But you have to work at it. You have to work at it continually. And uh, you should crowd out the old thoughts of things. I was talking, I had a nice conversation with a lady yesterday in Tennessee. She'd watched our videos on the internet and our church website. And she called about something. We got to talking about music. And she said, I'm more convinced now that all music is spiritual of some kind, either good or bad. And I said, you're right. I said, uh, the Bible says, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Psalms, those are psalms. The psalms are the songbook of the, of the Bible. 
uh, hymns, those would be any song Christians write to glorify God, by which they, they glorify God, remind themselves of what they believe. And spiritual th songs are anything that, I suppose, lifts the spirit. It doesn't have to have a gospel message or have any words to it, but anything that lifts the spirit. I said there's clearly a distinction or a, a, mar a, a division between orchestral classical music and, you know, Beastie Boys or Fine Young Cannibals or, or Death Metal or any of that other garbage. There's clearly a difference between those two things. And uh, she had to agree. And I said, now, you have to be very careful, even in the Christian music that you, you want to listen to. I said, sometimes it's a matter of, of time, putting time between you and the junk you used to listen to. The longer you can go without listening to it the, and, and saturate your mind with something more redeeming, uh, the better off you're going to be. But God cares about the holiness of the mind. Crown out the carnal thoughts and replace them with those things that are honoring and pleasant in the eyes of the Lord Jesus Christ. Point number three, consider holiness in attitude. Peter also warns us uh, about being holy in verse 13, about being sober, sober-minded. That means to take these things, these issues, these matters seriously in, in life. And don't be caught off guard. The Apostle Paul uh, writes, See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Ephesians 5.15 To be circumspect means you are paying attention to everything around you in all directions. And with that knowledge, you are careful about every step you take in life careful about every decision you make. I imagine more Christians have ruined themselves, ruined their testimonies, ruined their lives, thinking a little sin isn't going to hurt me. I can go to that party with my friends that I work with and no harm's going to come. I can go out and have a few beers with the guys after work and uh, you know they know that I go to church on Sundays. They know I, I claim to be a Christian, so what harm can it do? And I don't know, who knows how many people have have thought this isn't going to be a problem and next thing you know they've got to say well you know I was at this house and everybody else was in the backyard and she and I were in the house together and we got alone and one thing happened and one thing led to another and next thing you know both their lives both their families both their marriages are ruined because they thought little sin nobody else will find out about it and what harm can it do and so forth a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump, the Word of God says. Uh, let me give you a personal example. It's been years since I preached this, and I'll, I'll um, tell you a story. When I was, when my wife and I and our kids were in Pensacola, I was going to PBI, Brother Tim Wilson and his wife, he pastored a church, he pastored a church in Tennessee even before he went to Bible school. So he had experience as a preacher and uh, he's, he moved back to Tennessee, pastors a little Bible Baptist church out in the country, and out in the middle of nowhere where God dwells. And, <laughs> and um, but uh, so even though we were students together, and uh, he was getting called away on occasion to go preach at other churches around the area. He had opportunities to go preach even as a student. And uh, he and his wife and my wife and I, we'd, We'd sit together in church every service. And on a few occasions, it was my wife's turn, the rotating schedule, to go work in the nursery. So once or twice, he was out of town preaching, and my wife was working in the nursery. I told myself, I'm not going to sit alone with somebody else's wife in the same row that we always sit in because I know how it looks and I know how Christians talk and you have to expect the worst from Christians you always have to believe the worst because they'll they'll satisfy you every time <laughs> if you expect the best you're going to just keep meeting with disappointment but if you go into something expecting them to take the wrong view expecting them to think the worst then you won't be disappointed when they do right and, and on, on occasion you'll be pleasantly surprised when they don't which is a nice blessing. But always expect the worst because usually the human nature in the flesh is going to provide the worst. But I decided I'm not going to sit alone with somebody else's wife 
I know how it looks, and I know what people think. People are carnally minded. The finest Christian you know is just as carnally minded as anybody else. Because the flesh is weak. The fl I'm telling you, the, the flesh, we say it's weak. But it's weak in that it, it wants to yield to temptation, yet it's strong, and it dominates everything about the rest of your life. So you need to be sober-minded. God says, be ye holy, for I am holy. You need to be sober-minded and pay attention to the world around you. Don't be caught off guard. Be careful of every place you go, everything you do, every person you're with. From the way you dress to the way you comb your hair, young men, young ladies. Uh, Paul said, abstain from all appearance of evil. And it begins with the attitude. Point number four. Consider holiness uh, in the present. In the present. The Apostle Peter also admonishes holiness in light of our position as sons of God. Verse 14, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. Before you were saved and you knew nothing about holiness, you knew nothing about righteousness, you knew nothing about virtue and clean living, uh, you were ignorant. But now if you remain ignorant, having been saved, uh, it's because you're disobedient. Because you're disobedient. In this day and age, many Christians <clears throat> will profess one thing on Sunday and do something else, live an entirely different way, Monday through Saturday. They're disobedient. <clears throat> and they're hypocrites. It's appalling what born-again, saved, regenerated uh, sons and saints of God will accept in the world. It shows in their sense of humor. It shows in the kind of music entertainment they enjoy. It shows in their, uh, the things they watch on television. It shows in their political views. It shows in, in jokes they laugh at. It shows up in, in every walk of life. They say, the Lord looks on the heart, you know. Judge not lest you be judged. You're being too legalistic and so forth. They say they care about souls, but they don't witness. They say they care about prayer, but they don't pray. They say they care about the Word of God, but they're not reading their Bibles. They don't know their Bible. They say they care about a thriving church, but they find every feeble reason to, to not attend the services or support the brethren. They say they care about godliness and morality and clean living and, and a good testimony and virtue, but they can't leave the boob tube off, the, the uh, unplugged from the Internet for 24 hours. I was talking to Brother Del Grande about this recently. We're talking about uh, kids that they got a screen in front of their face 24 hours a day. Why? What is so important that commands your attention 24 hours a day? So you sleep with it by your pillow in case you get an important text during the middle of the night. That's crap. I work in the funeral business during the day, during the week. <clears throat> and you'd be amazed at the things I've seen people who are so attached to their cell phones. First of all, let me start and me back up. Let's lay a few groundwork work here. Uh, second graders don't need a smartphone. Third graders don't need a smartphone. You don't need one until you can afford one of your own. If your dad and mom are paying for you to have a five or $600 smartphone and you're loading every worthless app onto it all day long, uh, you're spoiled, you're spoiled. When you, can, when you have a job and you can pay for it and, and afford it on your own, that's, be, that's your business. But until then, you don't deserve it. Right? Not only do I see people come into the, my job with little kids and they just give them an a iPad or a smartphone to play with to keep them occupied during the funeral service. I've seen funerals where... We have to make the announcement now. It's necessary to everybody silence your cell phones, and we've all heard that before. I've been at funerals where uh, somebody gets their phone out, and they want to take a selfie with them and, and dad, grandpa in the casket behind them. I, went to a, I worked a, a funeral for a young couple that had a, a stillborn child. The second one they had lost in pregnancy. And uh, they, the cemetery put a little tent because it was hot that day. And under that tent, there was a little baby casket. And there was a minister standing there. And the, the dad and mom, and he's got his arm around his, his uh, wife. <clears throat> a handful of guests, just a few people. And I was there. 
and the minister's talking, and all of a sudden, dad's cell phone goes off, and he pulls away from his wife and goes out away from the tent to take his call in the middle of his kid's funeral. I've seen people who are self, uh, walk into a, uh, will process into a Catholic church. At every Catholic church starts this formal procession, like some big thing's about to happen. <clears throat> Nothing happens, but I will sit the pallbearers on one, one side of the main aisle and the family on the other side. And at one time, one of the pallbearers' cell phone went off in the middle of the service, and instead of pulling that thing out quickly and silencing it, or shutting it off, he scratches down real low in the pew to take the call, hoping nobody will see him. Right in the middle of the funeral service. And uh, it's amazing the things that people are distracted by. It used to be if you were a doctor or an attorney and you had the money to pay for, you could have a, a, a cellular phone. You might need to be on call. But if you're Joe the plumber, or you're, <laughs> or you're picking fruit out in the field because you're an illegal alien, you don't need a cell phone. I mean, I mean who import, what important call are you going to get? Point number six. Well, if I were on that, point number four. Point number five. Consider holiness in the future. Peter also says, verse 13, at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The next time you're tempted to sin or neglect some matter of cleanliness and virtue and holiness and obedience to God, ask yourself, would I want God, if I want, would I want Christ to catch me doing this thing if he were to come back right now? It ought to keep you on the straight and narrow. The soon return of the Lord Jesus is what we're waiting for, we're praying for. We sing about it, we talk about it, we pray about it. And I want to see it. I don't want to just have it in, in theory. I want to see the Lord Jesus Christ. And I don't want him to come back and catch me uh, involved in something or dwelling on something that is un, uh, unprofitable as a child of God. God wants you to be holy because he wants you to serve him, to be able to do something for him. Are you wasting too much time on the internet or on your phone or watching television? David said in Psalm 101, and it applies to uh, your phone as much as it applies to television. I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. He that worketh deceit shall not dwell within my house. He that telleth lies shall not tarry in my sight. That pretty much eliminates every talking head on every political roundtable show on Sunday mornings. That eliminates just about every newscaster. The weatherman doesn't even tell you the truth. He can't tell me if I need an umbrella three days from now or... What the temperature is going to be. He said it was going to be 110. It turned out to be 117. He lied to me. <laughs> so that, that pretty much eliminates everything you see and hear. Brother Everett and I, Brother Everett and I have talked about this before. Just about every, every position a newscaster takes, take the opposite. Take the opposite position. You'll be more right than you realize. No unsaved newspaper reporter or newscast news reporter uh, can tell you the truth about any issue. They're not looking at it from God's perspective. What does God stand to gain or to lose in this matter, in this issue? How does it affect the spiritual life of Christians who live in this country? So on. But uh, the Lord Jesus is coming back soon, and his text says, In the light of this, be ye holy, for I am holy. And um, lastly, point number six. I want you to consider holiness in service. Holiness in service. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, Paul writes, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Not unreasonable for God to ask, of this, ask this of you. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and perfect and acceptable will of God. Acts chapter 3, verse 12, Peter asked the people, Why look ye so earnestly on us as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? In Matthew 17, verses 18 to 21, Jesus rebuked the, the devil to come out of a boy who was possessed, and he says to his disciples and those around, Howbeit this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. 
Holiness is tied then to your having power with God, power in your life as a Christian, power with your testimony, power when you witness some unsaved person. You don't want to be a hypocrite and, 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 and try to reach a lost person for Jesus Christ. Holiness then, uh, certain hard cases require holiness, like casting out a devil or rebuking some unclean spirit. Do we walk around looking for de devils and people to be possessed? No. Charismatics do, but we don't. A lot of it, listen, Bob Jones' famous motto was, undoubtedly the trouble is with you. Don't blame everything on the devil. You have a flesh that's weak and wants to sin and wants to get away with sin, wants to rationalize sin, explain it away and say there was good reason why I did that or I'm not as bad as the other guy. Don't compare yourself to the other guy. What did you do? And so uh, I don't go through life thinking the devil's behind everybody's sin and wickedness. I think that person's behind their own sin and wickedness. And they're going to have to give an account of themselves one day. They're not going to be able to stand. Well, the devil made me do it like Flip Wilson back in the 70s would say. How badly do you want holiness? Let me bring this to a close. Listen to what we read in Hebrews chapter 12 and verses 6 through 10. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. But he, God, for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. You obeyed your father when he spanked you to straighten you out. The Lord chastens and corrects you for misconduct as a believer. It's because he's trying to bring out the best in you and make you into a holy child of God. For your profit and to, to make you obedient and to make you holy. It's God's stated desire for you and me. We'll close right here. Be ye holy, for I am holy.